the European Bifurcation Club uh, meeting 2021. For sure, I think that all of us are a little bit more happier than in the past to, to see each other because we survived uh, this incredible time. And uh, we have this, uh, this session that is basically focused on cases, but these cases have been selected not by, I mean, the attitude of proposing uh, the good case by the operators, like happens into the normal uh, meetings, but trying to ask to the uh, principal investigators that are conducting studies, that have big registries, that are in the, in the uh, crow of uh, uh, important trials, to uh, share the cases that are also part of the publications. So, so we will have the opportunity to see cases occurred during trials. So the, uh, I, I will have uh, uh, with me a distinguished uh, group of co-chair, Nicola Amabile and Eric Ekaut. And uh, we have as panelists uh, uh, Valeria Paradies that will be also uh, the um, digital moderator, Adela Aminan, Luis Antonio uh, Irigo Garcia, uh, Vaniko Kanic, and Narek Zakarian. So the first presentation will be by a, 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 a professor that cannot be presented by myself because it's really too important, uh, Reno Virmani. We have the pleasure to hear about uh, very late stent thrombosis in ostia of the bifurcation lesion, correlation of computed tomography imaging with histology. Dear Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC meeting 2021. My title of my talk is very late stent thrombosis in osteobifurcation lesions, correlation of computer tomographic imaging with histology. These are my disclosures. Now I'd like to start with where do atherosclerosis form in bifurcation sites. As shown here many years ago, the sites marked with the red line, A, B, C, and D, are the regions where atherosclerotic plaques form. But on the other hand, E, G, and F, that is the region of the carina, is spared from any lesion formation. As you can see in the next, I'm going to show you when stents are deployed in these regions, what happens. As you can see here, we have shown that in stents, where stent are more likely to form thrombosis are, if you look at neurointimal thickness, it is the least in the flow divider region as compared to lateral. If you look at struts with fibrin, more likely to see at the bifurcation, at the floor divider rather than at the lateral wall, and uncovered struts are more commonly seen at the carina as compared to the uh, lateral wall, that is floor dividers. Now, these are the common techniques used for implanting stents. We know that one stent only has the best results. However, there are lesions in which we cannot de deploy just one stent, and we need to deploy two stents, and there are various techniques, and obviously you know more than even I do on these techniques. I'm going to concentrate on what happens when we put in a stent. Here is a bifurcation lesion that we recently reported that showed very late thrombosis in the osteobifurcation lesion assessed by micro-CT. A 74-year-old man, five years after drug looting stent implantation into the LAD, had very late stent thrombosis caused by the struts protruding into the ostium of the left circumflex that remained bare, that remained uncovered. As shown in this, micro CT is shown on the right. The radiographic images shown on the left, you can see how clear the images of micro CT are. You can see the bend at the ostium of the left circumflex of the struts, in this case, Endeavor, and you can see here the area highlighted here at the bifurcation showing thrombus in the ostium of left circumflex and the red uh, arrows point to that area. And you can see the thrombus very clearly in the histology and again showing the cross section of that lesion showing the circumflex and this is where the number of stats are there. You find the site of where thrombosis occurs is at the ostium. Now, I've put together this 
features of the left main stenting at the bifurcation. This is a paper we wrote some time ago, and we had a total of 35 stents that were deployed at the bifurcation. Struts that stents that failed were 54% as compared to patent stents, which are 46%. And I'm going to show you the various techniques that were used that are used commonly and showing what happens in them, what are the underlying causes of thrombosis. As shown here, here is a single strut. You can see single stent, and at the bifurcation there is, you can see that there is, at the bifurcation, thrombus formation in the circumflex. On the right side is shown a kissing lesion, the left anterior descending, and the left circumflex. And again, because there are so many struts in the osteal region, you, that leads to stent thrombosis, as shown in these pictures. Now, here is an example of a crush technique, and this has led to the formation of stent thrombosis purely because of malapposition. And the struts are shown in red, as you can see, they are malaposed. There's an underlying plaque, and you can see here again, malapose struts and luminal thrombus. So this led to malapposition occurred during crush stenting. Here's another example, different example of uncovered struts that may also lead to stent thrombosis, and you, the asterisk points to all these uncovered struts. This was occurred 18 days after implantation in the left main circumflex and left anterior descending artery, and you can see the thrombus formation. Now you can also get protrusion of a necrotic core into the lumen as shown here. You can see this is a patient who had endeavor stent implanted in the left anterior descending and diagonal branch, four days post PCI for acute myocardial infarction. The necrotic core is protruding into the lumen and that led to the thrombus formation. Now here we show the major causes of timing and for the stent thrombosis. In the early time point, less than 30 days, you can see there were 10 cases. And in the later time point, there were uh, four cases, 31 to 365 days, and greater than 365 days for another four stents. The main causes of thrombosis was malapposition, struts in crossing of, of side branches, and protrusion of those struts into the lumen and uh, uncovered struts. And of course, the hypersensitivity can also lead to stent thrombosis. Here are two examples that I'm going to show you in recent cases that we've done micro, micro CT. There's an 89 year old male with multiple stents uh, in the proximal left anterior de descending six years after implantation. This is to show you the area of the bifurcation. You can again see the stent. You can see the calcium. This is micro CT showing the images longitudinal cut. You can see the calcium very clearly. And this is where we did at the bifurcation site. You can see the stent in and showing the cross section. You can see the thrombus in the lumen side of it and histology to correspond with it. The next case is a 60 seven-year-old male with non-ST elevation MI and Zion stent was implanted in the proximal left anterior descending artery 1.5 years after implantation. And you can see this is a fairly successful stent and the struts are covered, although they are present. Why did they not thrombose? Probably because of anticoagulation. And also it could be that the patient, these struts are further apart than would normally be. And if they were equally distributed, you can see that they are covered with new intima and that the side branch remains patent as shown here in the histology as well as in the micro CT images. You can see this is with calcification. We can remove the calcium and show you the distorted shape at the site of the bifurcation itself. So in conclusion, the main cause of bifurcation stenting was stent failure or thrombosis from strut and osteo side branch, malapposition, uncovered strut, protrusion, necrotic core, and hypersensitivity. Micro CT with higher resolution than clinical CT has been explored for the study of coronary atherosclerosis, and micro CT is useful to assess details in three dimension for strut positioning that lead to stent failure, especially as a tool for bifurcation lesions. Thank you so much.
So, Professor Virmani, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, uh, before uh, giving the word to other people, I have a, a, a question that is in my head uh, every day. So, uh, according to the, the, the last studies, uh, it seems that malapposition in, in the stents is not uh, uh, so st strictly related uh, with stent thrombosis, while other aspects like uh, under expansion make may be more important. This according to, I mean, clinical data, but uh, I saw the data, the, the Im images you, uh, you provided us, and uh, I saw that there was uh, malapposition often coupled with other problems. Do you think that the bifurcation is uh, a situation in which the turbulences may make malapposition more problematic than other situations? I, I'm not so sure the flow makes the difference problematic. I think it is more the underlying plaque that you can't see, you can't see the corina very well. So I think you tend to think that you're well expanded and most of the times if, if you don't do IVIS or you don't do OCT, you don't know where your struts are. You can't see them. So I think these techniques require imaging. Without imaging, you will have much more complications because you know under expansion or malapposition, whether you call it under expansion malapposition, I think they're the same thing. Whether it is because you left it that way or it occurred afterwards, I don't know that. <clears throat> but I think uh, it is difficult to do these techniques without a good imaging technique. That's a great message. And geography is not good enough for me. So I, I think that this is a great message because it integrates well uh, with uh, what is uh, currently recommended by the European Bifurcation Club. Dr. Viermani, it's regarding the technique of double stenting. I'm a big, uh, let's say, defender of the provisional stenting approach. And when I do a tap technique, usually you expect a certain amount of struts protruding in the main vessel. But it seems that, uh, according to your presentation, this is a main cause of, uh, because we know that stress protruding will not endotelize uh, for a long time. So how do you have, do you have to do an imaging after uh, every, uh, let's say, tap stenting to, to, to see what, to what extent the struts are protruding? Because the, depending on many aspects, the angle of the bifurcation, the, you, sometimes you, you cannot avoid a certain amount of, of strut protruding in the, in the main branch. So should we then uh, be more careful about the anti-thrombotic strategy? Uh, so these are open questions, of course. I th thank you for the question. I totally agree. For one, <clears throat> imaging is the most important. Second, I think dilatation of the side branch is important so that you don't leave the struts in the middle. I think the more they're in the middle, the more the turbulence is going to be and the more likely you're going to get thrombus. And if you don't give anticoagulants, you certainly will be in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first case that we showed five years afterwards, getting a thrombus and no coverage of struts, that just tells you you've left a lesion that is never going to heal. So therefore you are going to require anticoagulation forever and I'm sure patients are not so obedient and take the anticoagulants every time they're supposed to, every day they're supposed to take it. They often, at least in the United States, <clears throat> they can't even afford it. So that's a other problem. So I think the interventionist needs to do a better job and make sure that the struts are not in the ostia, not in the center of the ostia. That I think can only be done if you do imaging. Okay, so if I catch well, it seems that the, the worst site for malaposition is in front of the ostium. Is the, is the area in which you, in, in where you find more thrombus and probably initiation of it. Um, thank you, Professor Vimani. Uh, I want you to ask uh, what is the impact of the extension, of the longitudinal extension of the malaposition uh, compared to the axial malaposition, so the distance from the strut to the wall. That, you know, when you're away from the carina, carina is very important because that's where the high shear is. 
So if you have done better malapposition, you know, prevented the malapposition in the corina, you will be in good shape because that's high shear. You're going to mm -hmm. make, what will happen is the platelets are going to aggregate there because of high shear. So you really need anticoagulation, especially in the early time points. I think six months is minimum that you need, if not a year. In lesions that you're doing, bifurcation stenting you're doing. So I, the more you are close to the carina and the more it protrudes into the osteum, the more likely you're gonna get a thrombus. Thank you very Thank much. You. I think that this is also important because the duration of doubt is a question of every day and uh, bifurcations are uh, not well represented in the trials that compare different uh, uh, regimens so far. So thank you very much. So uh, Professor Virmani, I think that uh, we have to move forward. Thank you again for staying with us. And uh, we move forward to the next uh, uh, speaker, outstanding and no presentation for him, uh, Professor Greg Stone. Uh, and he present, uh, st presents a stance thrombosis notice during Excel. Hi, this is Greg Stone, and it's my pleasure today to present a case of definite stent thrombosis from the Excel trial. These are my disclosures. So this patient was a 64-year-old man who presented with unstable angina. He had a past history of non-insulin treated diabetes and hypertension, a well-preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, and a site reported syntax score of 24. This shows his right coronary artery on the left. You can see it was pretty normal. And his left coronary artery is on the right, which shows a Medina 111 left main lesion. Here we go, other views of the left main coronary lesion, spider view, showing the lesion is severe, distally and in the circumflex, and in the iliocranial, you can see LED involvement. So intravascular ultrasound was performed from the left main to the LAD, and here are selected cross-sectional images. You can see the distal left main is fairly severe, some calcification, um, the bifurcation lesion also moderately severe. The LAD osteum has what looks like a calcified nodule and the distal LAD reference has some mild disease. You can see the vessel measured about four to four and a half millimeters throughout the left main coronary artery. The LAD osteum was about 3.1 millimeters and then it expanded to about 3.7 millimeters a little more distally. Those are the reference uh, external elastic membrane measurements. So the left circumflex uh, and the LED were predilated, and then the operator decided to do a culotte technique, and a 3.0 15 millimeter stent was placed in the distal circumflex artery. Here you see the stent being um, placed on the uh, left screen, and on the right screen you see the angiogram after the stent was placed. Uh, you can note that there is a stenosis distal to the stent, but this was not treated at this time. So that was a 3.0 15 millimeter stent. So the operator then put a 3.5, 18 millimeter stent to the LED um, um, going back into the left main. Here you can see the LED positioning of the stent on the left screen. And then put a, there was an edge dissection after that stent was placed. So we put a second 308 millimeter stent to the um, uh, proximal to mid LED. And here you can see the angiograms after the LED stenting. You can see good patency um, and uh, minimal residual stenosis in the left main and the LED. You'll notice though in the circumflex that there's a fairly severe stenosis after the circumflex stent, possibly an intramural hematoma. Uh, this was not treated at this time. We don't have the reasons one way or the other, but of course this wire was trapped. And so the wire was pulled. Uh, as you see on the right, the operator performed a left main and LED pot multiple LED post dilatations, trying to rewire the true lumen of the circumflex, but was unable. And so you can see a wire in this high rising uh, first obtuse marginal branch, but the main circumflex artery was never rewired. So the operator then performed IVIS again of the left main and the LED, and here's some selected images. And basically you see very good expansion in all the locations. 
The left main minimal stent area was 9.3 millimeters squared and the LAD osteum was 7.3 millimeters squared. This is a final IVUS run from the LAD to the left main. Here you can see that calcified nodule, um, but still the overall stent expansion is quite good. Lumen is good, the stent is uh, well opposed, no edge dissections, no malapposition. And here we are in the left main. So this is the final angiogram. And you can see the, there is flow into the circumflex artery. Uh, the left main and the LED look very, very good. Um, perhaps the proximal osteal LED looks like a 10% stenosis angiographically, but it looked good by IVUS. But you can see this quite severe stenosis after the circumflex stent. And here you can see uh, mainly the LED um, on the right hand image. So the patient um, after the procedure uh, was asymptomatic, no periprocedural infarct. He developed bleeding from the left groin, which was treated with two units of blood transfusion. Uh, because this clopidogrel was, was withheld and the patient was discharged four days later in stable condition on aspirin only without clopidogrel or another P2Y12 inhibitor. The patient was well for one week and then had increased dyspnea and chest discomfort, which were intermittent for two days. He consulted his general practitioner. To our knowledge, nothing was changed. On day 13 after discharge, which was 17 days after the stent was uh, placed, he had severe chest pain, uh, marked dyspnea, and an ambulance was called. During the ambulance transport to the hospital, the patient had a ventricular fibrillation arrest and CPR was initiated. In the CCU, the patient had recurrent ventricular fibrillation and pulseless electrical activity. He was taken to the cath lab with CPR ongoing. Here's his EKG um, at the urgent admission. You can see marked diffuse ST segment depres depression with ST segment elevation um, only in AVR, which sometimes is indicative of left main occlusion. And here's the angiogram while CPR is being performed. And you can see there's total thrombotic occlusion of the proximal left main coronary artery. So the operator performed thrombectomy, ballooning, placed um, additional bare metal stents, all without improvement. Here you can see intermittently with CPR being withheld, a little bit of flow restored into the LAD and minimal branches, but essentially um, a Timmy zero to one flow and you can see there was never flow restored to the apical uh, LAD and never flow restored to the circumflex artery. Unfortunately, this patient, as you might expect, uh, expired in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. So this was an unfortunate case of a severe stent thrombosis in the Excel trial. We did not have many stent thromboses in Excel. The rate was only about 0.7%. Uh, um, uh, perhaps 1.1% um, definite or proximal later. Um, in this case, clearly, uh, I think what contributed to the stent thrombosis was the fact that first, the patient had a severe outflow stenosis in the circumflex artery. Um, so a stent thrombosis of the circumflex would not have been surprising, uh, but here we had stent thrombosis in the left main. And I suspect what happened is because the patient was discharged on aspirin only, when the circumflex um, occluded, the thrombus propagated proximally and into the left main. Maybe the left main occlusion might have been prevented had the patient been uh, discharged on dual antiplatelet therapy, but that of course is total speculation. So an unfortunate case, a rare case of stent thrombosis from the XL trial, showing the importance of optimal technique, um, optimizing all stenoses, not only at the stented sites, but also both inflow and outflow stenoses, and uh, uh, necessarily the importance of optimal pharmacotherapy. Thanks very much. So, so the, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I think that is really highly informative for us uh, to have access uh, to the images of the cases because uh, I mean a number in a table is something, but if you may have a look on, 
on the images uh, you, you learn. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, in the past uh, we asked the companies mainly to improve the devices and they did in the past. So now when we look at the cases that are going badly, most of the time we find, we find something that can, can be done in other ways during the procedures, but looking for it, we have still the, pro the problem of selecting the, the good steps and this is why EBC is so active. Thank you very much for sharing. We have a question. Yes, uh, a question to Professor Stone regarding this very interesting case. So th there is an unfortunate sequence of, uh, of event that has led to this very bad outcome in this patient. See, if I understand well, the, the operator went for a two-stand technique in this, in this, uh, in this case. Oh, it was a killer technique. And the first question, I haven't seen an IVUS from the circumflex before stenting the circumflex. Well, maybe that could have uh, led to, uh, let's say, uh, Missizing or oversizing, I don't know. This is the first thing. And secondly, the, the bleeding at the level of the groin uh, has also uh, initiated a vicious circle of uh, bleeding and withdrawal of the, of the anti thrombotic treatment. So, in, in Europe, uh, I think also in here in Belgium, we, we use a lot of radial access for that kind of case using seven French even through the radial. So, this is another maybe. Uh, thing that could have helped to, to avoid this situation. So I see some kind of uh, um, thing that have been missed in this case that could have maybe prevented this complication. I don't know if you, if you agree with me, Professor Stone. Yeah, I think, I think those, are great case, those are great points. Um, uh, you know, Excel was done largely before um, radial access was as common as it is today. I will say though, uh, uh, we had a lot of European sites in Excel and of course, radial access during the XL time was common in Europe, and this was a European site. But many sites still use femoral access, especially when they're doing a planned two stent technique. Um, I think angiographically, uh, it was um, a reasonable planned two stent technique. It uh, angiographically probably would have made the definition two criteria of a complex lesion. Uh, I certainly agree with you, though, that um, Ivising of the CERC would have been indicated and may have shown uh, not only the appropriate size and length of the disease, um, but uh, um, uh, you know, also perhaps might have shown that there was less disease. Maybe this could have been managed provisionally. I think from a technique point of view, you know, the biggest thing was that there clearly was um, a dissection um, and or hematoma after the CERC stent was placed. And one of the keys of all these two stent techniques, um, whether it's a crush, DK, mini crush, DK crush, culotte, et cetera, is that once you put the first stent in and it's a stent technique where you're going to trap wires, uh, if you see any problem in that vessel, you need to take care of the problem in that vessel um, uh, and make sure that vessel is stable before you go on to the second vessel. And there was a clear issue in the CERC after the first stent that should have uh, required either an IVIS um, OCT or ballooning or probably another short stent. I think that would have obviated a lot of the situation. And then the last thing I'll say is regarding the um, pharmacotherapy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really too bad um, uh, that they had to send the patient home on, on uh, monotherapy. Again, I think the questions that come up is could they have sent the patient home on um, uh, dual antipyloid therapy once the bleeding had resolved? Um, and if they had sent the patient home on monotherapy, I would have chosen an ADP antagonist. Yeah. Um, uh, aspirin is uninvolved in the stent thrombosis uh, hierarchy. And I think that, again, this may have been prevented had the patient been sent home on clopidogrel rather than just aspirin. So I, I think that the case was really great because it uh, was mm -hmm. showing the possible interaction that uh, between, uh, I mean, uh, pharmacological aspects, uh, uh, access issues, uh, imaging uh, uh, application, but not followed. Uh, in a pro I mean, uh, not uh, good reaction, probably perfect reaction to the small complications like edge di dissections. So probably, I mean, uh, when we have stent thrombosis, uh, there's these, these mixtures of uh, uh, adverse events that is leading uh, to this deadly com com complication. So thank you very much for, for your contribution. I think that you really added a lot to this session. 
And uh, as EBC, we are very grateful for your involvement and participation in our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, Antoniette Neylon, and uh, she will uh, share with us a stent thrombosis notice during the last uh, left main technique trial at the EBC main. Dear Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present at EBC 2021. Uh, I'm going to show you a case of stent thrombosis from the EBC main trial. So this is a case of a 73 year old male who's an ex smoker with a history of hypertension and dyslipidemia. And for symptoms of angina with a positive stress test, he was randomized in January of 2019 to the stepwise provisional arm. So this is the index procedure. So we can see distal left main lesion 011 with this second lesion in the mid circumflex uh, that was uh, deemed to be a separate lesion from the bifurcation. And we can see that there's quite significant calcification at the distal left main, the level of the carina extending into both circumflex and the LAD. So this is the QCA from the procedure. And we can see that there's quite a, a long length of lesion in the circumflex, which is the side branch, about nine millimeters, um, with the severe part of the stenosis really at the distal left main towards the ostium of the LAD. So because of the calcification, the um, circumflex and the LAD were pretreated with a rotablator. And following this, then the circumflex was stented with a 318 stent in the mid part of the circumflex. So uh, avoiding the bifurcation. And then the osteal part of the circumflex was also predilated. So attention was then turned to the main branch. So the main branch was stented with an Onyx 4022 stent, and this was optimized in the proximal part of the left main with the pot. And here we can see the result in the osteal part of the circumflex after that. Then there's a significant stenosis uh, and geographically here, and that was treated with sequential balloon inflation first um, towards the circumflex and then towards the LAD. And following this, then a final pot was performed. And we can see then the results of the uh, angiogram after this in the final images here. So there's a good result in the main branch. And we can still see there's this residual stenosis at the ostium of the circumflex where we have the geographic miss here and it's 48% by QCA. So this patient was then discharged uh, on aspirin and clopidogrel, but about three weeks later, comes back with severe chest pain and is in the hospital or gets to medical attention within 30 minutes um, with diffuse lateral ST elevation. And um, you can see here the angiogram first image, we have a, an occlusion at the ostium of the circumflex with probable thrombus. You can kind of see this filling defect here at the ostium. So it's within five, it's within five millimeters of the stent. So it's a stent thrombosis. So this was first treated with a uh, wire and balloon. And then following that, the um, circumflex was stented with a 318 stent. And um, there is final kissing balloons in the LED circumflex. Uh, three O balloons. So this is the result at the end. We can still probably some thrombus here just at the level of the crina and the plavix or clopidogrel at this stage for the discharge was changed to ticagvalor. Now this patient had a, an uncomplicated hospitalization after uh, this uh, serious event. Um, 
because he got to um, he medical attention uh, within 30 minutes, uh, LVEF was preserved um, after this event and he did well. So I think this case uh, really opens a lot of discussion points for us. So, I mean, it's a case of stent, acute, subacute stent thrombosis. If there's a few points we can raise for this. You know, is it reasonable to consider the mid-circumflex stenosis to be um, apart from the left main stem bifurcation? Um, there was significant side branch disease for about nine millimeters. And is that a factor in this? Um, also, what to do after rotablator? Um, uh, does that mandate uh, further treatment? Does it mandate a stent for us? And, you know, could imaging play a role in this case? Would it have changed this case? Um, could it have been an argument for going that extra step in the stepwise provisional approach? So, We've seen a case of complex distal left main lesion, uh, calcified lesion, pre-treated with a rotablator. Um, uh, and in such cases where we have complex side branch disease with long, a relatively long segment of disease, and if we're going to pre-treat with a rota, you know, the geographic miss is important. Um, and should that mandate a stent in this case, particularly when we're talking about the left main and the amount of myocardium that's subtended. And how important is imaging in this particular case? You know, if we decide that we're not going to stent it, do we need to do imaging to actually support that decision? Um, or is the angiogram in itself enough? So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this case and look forward to the discussion that it's going to generate. So Dr. Nilone, Nilone is with us, so uh, we may ask her what uh, we want. Uh, maybe, no, maybe I, I, I would like to have a comment. Uh, one of uh, the, the, the features of the provisional performed in the BC main was the fact that the sequence for provisional was, uh, um, was uh, suggested, and uh, here, uh, it was uh, almost uh, all uh, followed. What uh, is uh, still not well defined is uh, when we need to implant a second stent. It is still the, the one of the doubt we have uh, in, in the daily practice of provisional, when the, the, the side branch lumen we achieved is sufficient and when the circumflex is the side branch, the doubt is even more important. So do you, like uh, on the basis of your uh, of this case uh, to suggest uh, to implant some more stent in provisional as compared to the 22 ra percent rate we had. Yeah, I mean, Please come to with the mic microphone in order for, for people that is connected or remote. It's always difficult because, you know, the patient is randomized to the one stent group and the operator wants to respect the, the protocol of the trial and, and uh, stay uh, with, and avoid crossover as much as possible to have, you know, in terms of having a clean result for the trial. Um, but it's a, it's a stepwise provisional approach and um, I think uh, given the length of disease in the circumflex and the adjacent lesion, that was treated as a separate lesion, not part of the bifurcation. Um, I think that, you know, perhaps had the group been different, nobody would have hesitated to put a second stent into the, into the circumflex. Thank you. So, I, I, okay, Nicola. First, thank you for this case. I mean, that's a very nice uh, case and nice illustration. I think it was quite challenging for EBC Maine because of the diffuse disease on the circumflex. I've got two questions for you. The first one is, you really highlight the potential ro role of imaging. If you would have to redo the case today in 2021, would you use imaging for, to guide your procedure? And the second question is, you mentioned the potential uh, advert uh, role of rotablator, and uh, do you think that over plaque preparation technique uh, like uh, lithotripsy might have uh, avoid the, the thrombosis. It's, 
um, it's it's difficult. I mean, for the first point, um, uh, I think that you know, if the patient uh, had been in the two, I, I, looking at the lesion visually, I think at the end of the procedure, um, I think there was an argument perhaps to to put a second stent in even without doing imaging. And we could see that there was a lot of recoil after each ballooning after the after the rotoblator. There was sequential high pressure balloons. And every time there was recoil and there was a significant stenosis at the end of the procedure. So I think just visually, um, uh, there was probably enough to, to go ahead and, and treat the bifurcation with a second stent. Um, obviously, um, IVIS or OCT, I mean, for the trial in total, there was about 30% of the cases um, were image guided. This case wasn't image guided. But um, I think that if we're going to perform very aggressive, not very really aggressive um, uh, balloon dilatation and uh, rotoblator at the ostium of circumflex and decide to walk away from it at the end of the procedure, we have to be very sure that it's okay, that we don't have significant dissection and um, that, it, that there's a reasonable MLA. And I think that imaging in that case, uh, you know, it's, it's almost mandated before you can walk away from it, just given the importance. It's not, you know, it's not every side branch. It's, you're talking about the left main, which gives it a, an, an extra level of, of, of importance. So, I'm not sure that I'll that. Yes, uh, I think it's all also very fair and honest to share this case because uh, at the base, uh, occlusions close to the left main are, are rare because we are in a high velocity setting. It's rare to have thrombosis. And of course, Imaging would have elucidated the true cause, whether it's a platelet issue or a suboptimal result issue, or a combination of both. So it's always a problem too, uh, too because this brings us back to the very old days of stent thrombosis, and where you know there are some uncertainties. But uh, the only thing we can say is that we don't really know exactly what happened because we're missing some imaging information. Uh, yeah, the, uh, and even you know the difference between. You know, preparing with an IVUS or preparing with a um, a rotoblator or a, you know the idea that shockwave is going to be less um, aggressive in terms of maybe the disruption in the endothelium. I guess we don't have a lot of of evidence. That's part of the problem. But you know, we always say that with a rota that it's going to avoid um, causing any harm to what's normal vessel. But there you can clearly see that at the bifurcation, there's no normal vessel there. It's very calcified, so it's going to cause disruption. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it's... Uh, so, but I think, you know, imaging would have certainly helped. But if this patient was perhaps outside of a trial, I don't think anybody... Maybe I'm wrong, but would, would anybody have left the result like that without a second stent at the ostium of the circumflex? Um, I don't... But that's why so. it's so honest of you of sharing it, because... Uh, People don't share it. Really yes, share yes. So I think that is That's very important message. because uh, uh, one of uh, the side effects of uh, the results of the BC main can be the fact that uh, stent in the side branch are not needed, but they are probably not needed when you have good result. And here, the, the trade-off was uh, really strong in favor <laughs> of the one stent was to have the disease, uh, se severe residual disease, that was uh, uh, aggressively pretreated. Pre this is another argument. I mean, one of the aspects of provisional is, uh, in the case you wanna, I mean, uh, not touch uh, the side branch, reducing the risk of stent of of, uh, of stenting is uh, to do not predilate too aggressively. But here, uh, I mean, uh, the preparation was very aggressive, including uh, rotablation. So I think that it was very important because, uh, again, I mean, let's remember that these cases are coming from, a, from a trialists. So good institutions, good operators uh, with the, the willing to share what they are doing. So this really uh, is important in my mind. We cannot uh, say this is something that is outside the practice because it is... Uh, inside the practice of good centers. So it, I think that uh, is important. So thank you very much for sh Ah, OK. So uh, Thierry, last uh, short Just, uh, question. A short comment uh, about the strategy, because there was no kiss in this case. So if you do the last balloon angioplasty toward the LED, then you push the carina toward the circle. So it, it will uh, may promote 
problem in the circ, which was already predilated uh, several times, and there was a lesion on the circ also. So, so you need that at the end you will finish with two stents, uh, up to the ostium or not, depending on the result that you have at the level of the ostium. So this is the first command. And the second one is that uh, it's very important to keep in mind that provisional does not mean one stent. It means one stent when, when we can, but two if you need. And in uh, EBC men, we need two stents in 22% of cases, in true 011 or 111 bifurcation lesion. So I think it's uh, very important to have that in mind always. Okay. So, also, thank also you very much. Very also, welcome. when you have a suboptimal result, angiographic result, and you don't do imaging and, and you don't have an FFR, whatever, if it's a circumflex, then it seems a very, very large circumflex here. Of the threshold to to put a second stand is even lower than a let's say a two millimeter diagonal or something like that. Okay. Thank you. So we move forward and we come back to US because we have connected an outstanding, although uh, young. Uh, uh, researcher uh, Akiko Meara, and uh, she will present a stent thrombosis uh, in this uh, left main stent that has been uh, uh, observed in her center. Dear Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC 2021 meeting. The title of my presentation is Stent Thrombosis in Distal Left Main Stents. This is a case from Colombia, not in the Excel trial. This is 84 years old female, and patient had the bypass about 20 years ago, and currently only patent SVG2 right coronary artery. And the patient having the stable angina due to this unprotected distal left main 111 region. And especially you can see the circumflex ostium is quite tight. This is an index procedure sequence, predilatation in the LED and circumflex ostium, and then circumflex to left main stent 3524, and the port was performed using the 40. After the wire, the mid LED was stented 3538. And then the LED left main stent, 3524. So this is how it looks like the wiring into the circumflex. And then LED left main ballooning, and then circumflex left main ballooning, and the KVT using 3535. This is how it looks like the final picture. Six weeks later, the patient come back to the ER due to the acute burning, chest discomfort, and diagnosed as non stemi At the time, the medication was ticagrelor and aspirin. Angiography showed the haziness of the circumflex ostium, and in this view, you may think this is, looks like slumbus. This is IBAS picture at the time of the index procedure at the end of the procedure from circumflex to the left main. I can see the medial dissection at the edge of the stent and even more clear. And this is a stent edge. And this side is even the eccentric calcium stent expansion seems to be okay by stretching the normal side. This is limus, here carliner, and bifurcation, and now in the left main. And you can see the double layer at the end of the stent, there is some malaposition. Let's talk the most important in terms of the circumflex ostium. Here is the circumflex ostium, limus, ostium, and left main. So what's happening is there is a limus. This limus is not big territory, but in terms of the diameter, it's not so small. At the site of the carina, between the sac and the limus, of course, there is a stent slot. But after merging to the limus, the carina of the sac, there is no stent slot, and there is a medial dissection. And this is a guide wire. So there is a stent slot here and here. So it seems to be 
double ray of the thin slot at the non collinear side of the circumflex ostium. In terms of the stent expansion, LAD and the left main seems to be okay. Circumflex ostium major 5.2 square millimeter, which is moderately under expanded. This is how it looks like the IBAS picture six weeks later. And it seems to be the distal edge dissection was healed. And here is the stent edge. And because of six weeks, there is no neointima at all. And coming back to the ostium. You can see the organized rhombus, which protruding to the left main. This is a summary at the index procedure final at six weeks later. And as we discussed, there is a no stent slot here and media dissection, double ray of the stent in non collinear side, and moderately under expanded. And six weeks later, we can see the organized rhombus here protruding to the left main. So what could be the cause? Circumflex left main was stented and put and after rewire and the balloon at the site of the circumflex ostium is actually because of the remus. This stent slot never touch fully to the vessel wall, actually close over to the remus. Already left main stent and then rewire to the circ from the distal cell. And because of the osteo circumflex was never attached to the vessel wall, and this wire is bringing to the strut at the circumflex ostium, move to non collinear site, and then finally this portion was not covered and remain medial dissection. And this is how what we can see. This type of the mechanical issue is not infrequent in the Excel trial, we see this type of the incomplete clash at the circumflex ostium or stent gap at the circumflex ostium. In the Excel trial, there is 127 cases having the two stent technique and the final IBAS. Out of those, 28% of the cases having the incomplete clash stent and 11% of the cases having the stent gap at the circumflex ostium, which is frequent in the T stent or clash, but still sometimes we see in the kilot stenting. What should have been done? Because there was a remus branch, the stent shot at the carina side of circumflex ostium or remus ostium was never attached to the vessel wall. After rewiring to the circumflex from distal cell, the stent strut at the circumflex carina was moved to non carina side. Along with the moderate and expanded stent at the circumflex ostium, slumbus was observed at the carina of circumflex six weeks later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, presentation. I think that uh, it is not uh, very common to have the possibility to have double imaging at uh, a procedure end and uh, the time of, uh, of uh, event occurrence. So I think that this uh, really allow, allowed you to do like uh, policemen uh, do. Do, do every day, I mean, to reconstruct all the history and uh, it was very impressive to see how imaging may help in doing. Uh, is there any question? Okay, we have Valeria. So Valeria here. Uh, yeah, just a comment, fantastic case. I think um, in this case you show that uh, uh, most of the time, indeed, there's a multifactorial uh, etiology for stent thrombosis and with imaging you can actually prove it. And the other comment is uh, like, um, you really underline how important it is that uh, if you decide and it's like advisable to use imaging for procedure, you should do each step um, like ideally um, with uh, an uh, imaging guide guidance because in this case you could have prevented like stenting um, uh, like wiring in the in the wrong, you could have like follow uh, with the imaging the, the rewiring 
uh, towards the circumflex. So it could have been really useful to have a, um, a technique, uh, imaging, imaging guided um, procedure, but step by step. Yeah, I think uh, I totally agree. I think like that this case is really the multifactorial, not just like the uh, gap of the carina, uh, but also small media dissection, and importantly, a little bit under expanded circumflex. So it's really multifactorial. Um, but I was thinking a lot about this case because typically at the during the cured stenting, we don't see this type of the issue. And then I really asked myself why this case such happened. And then finally I thought because of the small limus branch that's giving us not never covered the circumflex system. So actually I would ask everybody for the ABC member uh, as an expert, because you say when you do the cured stenting, you have to do the distal wiring. But in such, this type of the cases, you have the Lima side branch and you are stent thread that the carina is actually not well opposed in the vessel wall. In such, would you like to recommend slightly differently, meaning not super distal, coming a little bit middle? What do you think? I think that you are you are correct. I think that the 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 idea of uh, uh, performing this rewiring makes sense in order to have the the best uh, deformation of the stent struts, but you have also to deal with the individual patient's anatomy. So in the case you have ectatic areas or branches that prevents good. Uh, that are preventing uh, the good apposition of the stent in the ostium, there is some risk when you go distal to take away from, uh, from, from the ostium the stent. Yet, uh, I think we have the possibility to hear about uh, one of the most expert, maybe the expert in the world for culotte, Professor Chevalier. I don't think I'm an expert in culotte, but um, I think it's important also to consider the number of pot you practice and the number of kissing. In that, in that case, there was only, if I'm correct, one pot with a 40 millimeter balloon, which is probably too small, as the uh, distal reference was 3.5 and 3.5. So if we apply the Murray Finet law, you do need to consider uh, probably a 5.0 millimeter uh, balloon for pot. So I think the absence of the two pot, maybe a third one at the end, on the absence of double kissing is probably one of the explanation of this uh, situation. And uh, and indeed, uh, Akiko, you uh, I mean called uh, in, into into the action uh, the ABC position paper regarding the, the how to best practice uh, the the culotte because uh, we it is true that we suggested that, but also we suggested according to Professor Chevalier's suggestions to do all these things, all the, uh, these other things. That means good expansion of the stent, check the POT repeated, the kissing balloon inflation. If you uh, step forward and you miss some steps, the safety of the same, uh, the, the same maneuver can be compromised. And this is uh, also another teaching. The fact that to try to, to adhere, adhere to the best sequence is something that uh, can prevent some of these pro kind of problems. I have a question. So imagine you have this clear information at the index procedure and you may anticipate potential stent thrombosis, but technically, how would you solve this? You have already two stents in place. So my question is, as a simple interventionalist, I see this, I want to anticipate it. How am I going to, to, to challenge this? So, Akiko, what, what, you explained what happened. What, what can you suggest to an interventionalist who recognizes this problem at the end of the procedure to do, to optimize? I think the only thing which we might have been done is opening the circumflex more. Because as you show, the circumflex ostium compared to the other, or compared to the size of the circ, it's relatively underexpanded. But to be honest, if I see, I didn't see this picture during the procedure, but if I recognize that's kind of like small and gap, I think that's, most of the people say, that's okay, this is very small amount of the gap. And this actually is not too big. 
I, I think that nobody putting the additional stent to cover such area. And again, the issue of this case is really multifactorial. Um, so only thing which we can do at the time of the procedure is a little bit more expansion for the CERC in addition to the port for the left domain. Thank you very much for your honest response because answer because I think that also, I mean, the one of the problem we are facing in, in our practice is the fact that we know probably all the correct sequence, but when we failed somewhere and we have to correct, we have no, I mean, knowledge about the best uh, way to, to correct some, some problems like that. And also the multifactorial uh, genesis of, uh, uh, of stent thrombosis uh, in this session is coming back more and more, I mean, across all, this, all these cases. So imperfections, probably one imperfection might be tolerated when you have more than one, it becomes a trouble. So thank you very much, Akiko. You have been uh, wonderful. Uh, we have been happy to have you with us. And uh, we hope in the future to host you for sure physically. Bye bye. So, uh, we, we now move forward. We have uh, uh, Robert Van Jones showing uh, uh, a very late stent thrombosis following provisional stenting with OCT documentation. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for uh, having the opportunity to present this case at the EBC 2021. I will be present on the case on very late stent thrombosis following provisional stenting and with interesting OCT images. This male patient of 71 years old had uh, previously a PCI for stable angina at an LED diagonal bifurcation. You can see the images of the first procedure uh, with this diagonal and the significant stenosis just distal to the side branch in Medina uh, 011. Um, it's up to three or four millimeters in the side branch. Now we could have a later discussion or should that be a provisional strategy with a pot only, provisional with kiss and pot, or provisional with pot side pot. Um, alternatively, if you, if you um, think this is a large one which has been pinched, also leaky crush or culotte could be options in this case. In 2020, the patient was treated with a provisional strategy with two wires the predilatation of the main vessel and sizing of the distal main branch, meaning a 3 0 uh, stent crossing over the bifurcation. Uh, you can see the result um, using the post dilatation. Although uh, POT is a strategy, uh, preferred strategy in our hospital, in this case, the post dilatation was a 50 millimeter long uh, balloon, which was not crossing over to the side branch but giving full expansion of the proximal part. Um, even as the vessel was pretty large, this 3.5 balloon did, did not result in a pinching, did not result in a occlusion of the side branch. The side branch was sufficiently open, although we, we could, could call it pinching, but there was teamless reflow, no chest pain, and no ECG change. And so the procedure was completed with that end result and the patient was treated with aspirin and clopidogrel for one year. After one year, the patient stopped his clopidogrel, well, uh, but a few days later, he presented to our hospital with the chest pain. Uh, the ECG showed hardly any changes. Uh, the troponin was 141, suggesting still that there was a coronary problem. The patient was having an urgent angiography, um, which didn't show that many abnormalities. The stent, both, the stent was nicely open, the side branch was still open, and we didn't identify any thrombus at that location, although the chance of having a stent from both was pretty high uh, so shortly after stopping his DPT. Therefore, uh, if we don't understand, we do an OCT. Uh, for this case, uh, the operator had to introduce uh, two wires, which was the first wire, the OCT didn't pass the stent. Uh, so there was a second wire introduced and the OCT pullback was started with the two wires in the healthy segment. A uh, nice apposition of the struts, um, nice new intima coverage of the struts. Uh, but if we go more proximal, we will see already some nail position, some segments of thrombus, and more proximal getting larger thrombus and having significant nail position of the main branch. 
or this is one of the images of the proximal segment, you could see that the stent is just open to its intended three millimeters in diameter, while the vessel at that location was 3.4 millimeters in diameter. Uh, the second wire is underneath some of these threads. That's why it was not useful. And we can see small thrombi and more proximal, larger thrombus sections, also in front of the side branch, which is indicated with the yellow line, um, and proximal opposite the side branch. So in the longitudinal reconstruction, you see the two segments of thrombus, and the mal opposition indicator demonstrates significant mal position of this stent in the yellow sections. Uh, this is uh, the thrombus opposite to the side branch, and this is the thrombus in front of the side branch. It was decided, I decided I think we needed um, post allotation. Uh, we have the really upside balloon, and you can see the position of the proba, much more to the side branch, was optimal, optimal position, covering both of just up to the carina and covering the proximal segment of the stand. After inf inflation, you can see on the stand boost, the stand is much better expanded and probably have full uh, position in that segment. Um, you can see side branch still looks okay. Therefore, we st uh, started another OCT session. Uh, this is the pre-image you have seen before. And we have now good expansion, full air position in this segment, but still we have thrombus in front of the side branch. And I think that was one of the discussion points we had. What should we do at this moment? We have an uh, geography OK image, uh, but we have still thrombus in front of the side branch. And should we treat that or should we not treat that? It was decided too, that that was potentially contributor to the thrombosis that we want to optimize the side branch. But therefore, I had to introduce a second wire into the side branch. First, a few wires that give quite some significant resistance, so it changed over for other wires, and in the end we had one wire more distal, uh, which was in the correct lumen. Uh, although the flow was uh, reduced somewhat, we started with a ballooning 1.520 balloon, um, but still we did not have an optimal result. We had to control OCT, we can see the significant amount of um, hematoma dissection and more hematoma proximal, and still thrombus in the ostium uh, of the side branch that will come up here. And now we cross up the main branch and we have inflow from blood um, at the end of the contrast injection. So the OCT, uh, just some uh, screenshot images here, distal hematoma, uh, dissection area, proximal hematoma, proximal thrombus, and more thrombus in here. And this is the main branch with the two wires and the insufficient flush. From that on, that amount of thrombus, that amount of dissection, we put in the 2.25 uh, DES combined uh, with a proba in the main vessel, resulting it uh, to a kissing and the final angiography result, which looked pretty much better to me. So I think this case was interesting because we had good OCT images of the follow-up. In this case, we have a failed uh, provisional strategy and we have to consider what did we do wrong. Of course, we have seen that the uh, pot balloon was too distal. The pot balloon was missing the proximal segment uh, of the stent. And the question is, was the site adequate? Potentially 3.5 should give full position. Um, I decided to do in the second procedure for four row balloon. The question which is, is that it's just a position in the main branch or is this pinching and the thrombus in the side branch ostium also a contributor to the stent thrombosis? Uh, so if we believe on that, the question is, uh, is the correction of the malposition only sufficiently or do we think there is an indication to treat the side branch to optimize the result and to avoid the thrombus formation in the side branch? I don't think that we have clear studies on that. Um, we have also seen the disadvantage of going to a more aggressive strategy uh, where we had more dissections and we had to put in another stand to get a full good angiography like result. So for that point, I would hand it over to the um, chairman of this session and see what the uh, chairman and the panelists uh, have as comments to this case. So thank you for your attention and hope to be back to you soon. Okay, so another case, another imaging modality.
Uh, probably, probably Nicola, expert of OCT, can comment uh, on the images. I think that the, there was go good documentation of pitfalls of provisional as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a very uh, nice case. It's uh, it's excellent to learn bifurcation and also potentially also the pitfalls of even like what could be um, a simple uh, pot side report or just a provisional uh, one stand. And you observe that we, we, we discussed with Adele and, and we think that um, it really illustrates that when you're doing your pot, you really have to be careful about being really proximal and be able to expand the first or s the first crown of the of the stand. Otherwise, you get this kind of uh, malaposition and potential long-term consequences. For sure, I, I think that uh, the the value of pot has been promoted a lot by the BC group. But uh, uh, what is now evident is the fact that despite it seems very feasible as a technique and very, let's say, uh, feasible in the end of any kind of experience of the operators, it really deserve to be appropriately done dedication so by the operator, regardless of the fact that this is a, an expert or a, 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 a nouvelle <laughs> uh, interventionist. To be here, we see that there is a huge late adverse events ju just related with the fact that there was not perfect, perfectly performed uh, pot. Because the, 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 the diameter of the chosen balloon for the pot was correct, but the fact that it was placed a little bit too distal, not a little bit, it was quite distal, maybe hampered a little bit the proximal expansion of the balloon, because it's strange that we had such a degree of malaposition. And of course, if you go beyond the side branch, but you, you, aggravate, you, you will worsen the, the, the carina shift. So this is another thing. So you, you create two, two conditions that are bad for the patient, a very important shift of the carina. And secondly, I've seen here that even if you place the balloon too distally, and if it, especially if it's a non-compliant balloon, you will hamper this, this adequate expansion proximally. So I think uh, if you do pot, you have to do it. Uh, just like a, stand, uh, a correct stand visualization, uh, option in your cath lab uh, allows you just to to get uh, yeah, of course, the, the of correct course, way. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. For the diameter, but not for the... I just have a question because we, we know from our recent colleagues that they are much more focused on imaging during PCI, and there are some trials that indicate that overall the outcome is better, although we didn't duplicate these trials in Europe. But, but why don't we only see the tip of the iceberg? Because on a well-packed practice, I think there's a lot of malopposition, there's a lot of issues, but why do we see so few patients like these that come up with clinical issues at, uh, at the long term? So there is something that we don't fully understand. But we definitely there are a lot of people walking on this planet with malopause stents and nothing happens but on the long run. It's probably because, as we mentioned earlier, uh, stent thrombosis is a multifactorial mm -hmm. process. And probably that to get a stent thrombosis, you, get, you need uh, like a mechanical abnormalities and a potential uh, a patient factor like diabetes, uh, poor led ventricle function, and also maybe uh, poor compliance or uh, resistance to clopidogrel. So what you are into the I, intersection, I, then you are in trouble. I, I, last year, I controlled by accident the patient with the Victor stand. So this stand is in for 25 years, I don't know. And there was malaposition <laughs> by accident because he had some restenosis. The images are, are impressive, uh, and it even doesn't seem covered, and still nothing happens. Yeah. So I, I think that this is the, OK, another comment, last one, because uh, now almost has the capacity to do stent viz or stent boost depending on what system you work with. I mean, should the EBC club put that step into their guidelines for provisional stenting? Because you can see that the problem, it was evident on the stent boost in the, in the event angiogram. So, you know, it's something that's widely available. It's, it's a type of, intra, of, 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 of imaging. Um, but rather than, you know, it's so easily it's so easily available in all cath labs now, should it be not put into the sequential steps of the pro so stepwise the provisional approach? This is, a, this is a really good suggestion, and uh, I think that uh, we may uh, discuss uh, internally for sure. I mean, uh, this is a tool uh, that uh, adds something. The problem is that... Uh, not always uh, you have a perfect imaging uh, when uh, there are complexity 
uh, in, in, like double stenting, sometimes the reconstructions are not so, so good. So there is uh, probably also still improvement for, for this technique and to, to, to add it to each pa passage step of the procedure add, adds also radiation for the patient. So there are many, many aspects, but it is true. I, I think that this is the minimum when we, we call into, um, into action the image, intravascular imaging, we should not forget the fact that the minimum should be good angiographic result and a good expansion of the stent. And when we have that, it makes sense to use all, all we have in the cat lab. So I think that this session was really outstanding. I do not remember in my life a, a stent thrombosis session based on cases so fruitful for, for me. So uh, I thank you all of you for attending it.